song, just follow the tempo and you pick it. It's, it's a very common song, it's very contextual to what I'm going to present. Now, this is risky business. <laughs> yeah, because I've never done this and don't try this at home. All right, all right, let's try it. Okay, this is working, that's good. That really frees me. <clears throat> How many of you know this song? Have you a heart that's weary, turning a lord of care? I'm trying to see whether that, that's a little bit high, isn't it? Let's, let's bring it down, in, uh, maybe a note or two. Have you a heart that's weary, Sending a lot of care. All right. We'll, if you know it, just come and stand here if, if you are blending in nicely. Because people will blame it on me, you know. <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> hey, have you a heart that's weary? Tending a lot of care. Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the bed and you bear? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know? I think, I think we've got a choir here. Let's try it one more time. And this time, we're going to be a little bit faster. And maybe bring it down, bring it up a little bit, just a note high. Right, let's start again. Two. Have you a heart that's wearing Tending a lot I've had a wonderful, wonderful two days uh, visiting some other places. I actually fled away from the city and went to smaller cities, and the Lord has been good. For those that have been uh, traveling with us and journeying with us, we are following a theme that's found in Revelation chapter 12, and the verse is 7. Revelation chapter 12, and the verse is 7. And the technical team have just put it up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. 
starting from tomorrow, going on up to the end of the program, we are changing gears. We, if you have noticed, there is uh, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation is pregnant. Yes, it is a very pregnant chapter. And yet we have hardly touched it. Tomorrow morning, uh, we are going to get in a little bit deeper into Revelation chapter 12. But the rest of the week, we will be getting even deeper into it. And let me invite you to invite your friends and neighbors because I believe, I find this healing. You know, at best we are wounded healers. So the message that we share first heals us because we need it just as much. So in Revelation chapter 12 and the verse is 7, the Bible says, and there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So we were looking at this great battle, this great war, rather, that is going on between good and evil. And uh, we saw it starting in heaven. We traced it from heaven. And then we saw it coming down to earth. And we discovered that it's even more personal than just being fought on earth. The target now is even our minds. We saw all that. But we saw on Wednesday night that the war, it's like we are watching uh, our favorite football team, but it's a delayed match. And we we, I'm not so much a fan of football, but I know guys in Australia because of the difference in time. They follow English soccer so much that it's played here while it's uh, 3, 4 a.m. in Australia. So they will be fast asleep. When they wake up in the morning, it's time to go to work. So they find that they already have the score line. They are team one. But what they do when they go to sleep is they put their, their, their gadgets in such a way that the, the match is recorded. So that when they come back from work, they will come and what? Watch that match. Now, it will be around about this time, they will be watching at 5, 6 p.m., a match that was played the previous day. Their Facebook um, friends have told them on social media that their team won. Whatever the other team will do, even if it threatens to score, it doesn't matter, we know the score line already. So whatever the devil is going to do, my friends, we have the results of the end of the match. Even if he threatens to destroy me, devil, whatever, you are going to bring it all. I know that at the end, my redeemer liveth and he's going to stand. So it's like we're watching a delayed match because at the cross, the devil, the devil was destroyed. He was conquered. The sentence was passed. We are just waiting for his jail time. We know his fate. Tonight, I want us to shift a little bit and if Jesus has won the war, then why the suffering? Do you ever battle with the silence of God? Matthew chapter 2 and the verse is 18. Matthew chapter 2 and the verse is 18.
a voice was heard in Ramah. Lamentation and weeping and a great mourning. Rachel is weeping for her children. But she refuses to be comforted because they are no more. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who was here long before we all arrived here because his heart yearns to connect with people like us. We have not been counted out there in the world. They know us by numbers, for social security. But we know that the Holy Spirit knows us by names. We know that Father, he cares so much that he knows when our very hairs fall from our heads. We thank you, Father, because of that. He's here, present but silent. He knows the needs of everyone, different as they are. And Father, we know tonight he is going to groan with groanings that we do not understand, but that he understands our groanings and present them before the Father with the language of heaven. So I pray, Father, that as he intervenes, Lord Jesus, help me. Amen. I came across in my primary school a poem when I was growing up. It was written by David Diop. He, I believe, is a Senegalese um, author. If not Senegalese, one of the Western countries. You will have to help me there. My memory does not serve me well. David Diop um, could be from Mali, could be from, from Senegal. In his poem, he cries for the African nation back home, the motherland, and in diaspora. But his words ring with meaning for every child of Eve this evening. Though it was written in that context, it reaches the power and the pathos of its words. They reach beyond Africa and its children in diaspora. And these are the words. Listen, comrades of the struggling centuries. To the king clamor of the Negro from Africa to the Americas, they've killed Mamba or they've killed the seven of Martinsville. Oh, the Madagascan down there in the pale light of the prisons, he held in his look, comrades, the warm faith of a heart without anguish. I could go on and on, but the first line catches me tonight. Listen, comrades of the struggling centuries, is the line I'm interested in. London, as we read your newspapers, it does show that we are living in the times of the struggling centuries. It's as if the words are being fulfilled here as Herod is killing the children during a time of struggle. And the words uh, of the prophet Jeremiah are being fulfilled. A voice is being heard, not in Rama, but in London. A lamentation and a weeping and a great mourning. Rachel is weeping for her children. And she refuses to be comforted. The human family, the human race is weeping. There is no comfort anywhere. Sometimes, just sometimes, we ask ourselves questions. Please don't go holy on me. But sometimes we ask the question, where is God 
when such suffering is happening. I got a call one morning from a good friend, senior elder at our church. You see, him and I had become so close because we had a ministry that we did just the two of us. We would go out and visit uh, particular friends. I found him with this passion. He had a particular niche in the society that he liked to reach out to, and he did it with success, and I would partner with him so I could learn from him, and we would go together. He was an elder at our church. He was the first elder. He was 82 years old, very healthy, conscious. He would tell me that he became a vegetarian in his mother's womb. He had never tested meat. He had never tested. Uh, largely, he had never really made use of sugar. And even at his advanced age, there is a race that is done in Sydney every year in August. It is a 25-kilometer, um, what do you call it now? marathon and you would find him there Bob would always be there even at his advanced age he would run however long it would take him and you say pastor you found me old in my younger days I would be there right in front with the winners I have lived a healthy life but one day he ran and said, Pastor, how does it happen that after I have lived such a health life, my blood results have come back and I'm told I have this cancer in stage four. And my doctor is telling me that I have three months to live. How does it happen, pastor? How does it happen, as the preacher is preaching back to me? How does it happen, pastor, that such a thing is told a man like me? We prayed with my good friend, Bob. I held his hand as death's cold finger was touching him as he breathed his last. I don't know if you've ever been there. Have you ever wondered why sometimes? Have you ever looked into the eyes of a little girl? Now, she is an adult, but she knows that when she was three, she was helpless. There was a creepy uncle who raped her. And her question is, Pastor, where was God? I was helpless. Are you telling me that his eyes were open when my uncle was raping me? Pastor, tell me, answer me. Sometimes we struggle with the silence of God. My friends, I hate to disappoint you. I'm not a bearer of good news tonight. So I suppose as I introduce my sermon, you, I've set you up to think that I've come with an answer to the silence of God. My friends, I don't have that answer. I don't. I'm not that wise. I'm not that wise. But what I know is what I'm going to share with you this evening. What I know is that God never intended for that to happen in the beginning. Genesis 1.26 tells us clearly. I'm going to ask the guys to keep on 
um, putting it on the screen so that we, we, I've got a few texts to read tonight. Genesis 1, 26, and here I have it. Um, it reads, then God said, let us do what? Make men in our, in our, after our likeness. Let them have what? Let them have dominion over the fish and over the sea and over the beds of the air and over every, over the cattle of, over all that the earth and over every creeping thing and that creeps on the earth. It appears to me as God creates man, after he has created everything, God is the king of the universe. He is the king even of the jungle, not the lion. But then he says, over the jungle, Adam and Eve, I am setting you as the what? Obviously not as the king, because God, that position is already taken. But since you are the children of God, you are a daughter and a son of a king, so what are you? You are a prince and a princess. On my behalf, you see, I have many other things to do. My dominion is much, much bigger. Because we know the author of the book of Hebrews in chapter 1 tells us that in sundry times, God spoke to us by the prophets, right? But in these recent days, he has spoken to us by who? By his son, by whom he made the what? Talk to me, church. All right, someone says he's made the world. Is that correct? He said by, by whom he made the world. As plural, not world. So God says my dominion is not just of this world because I made many worlds. But as for you, Adam and Eve, I am setting you as a prince and a princess. Rule on my behalf. It is my reign. It is the reign of God. But by extension, I'm giving you to rule and reign. Have dominion over everything. Nothing reigns over you. You reign over everything. And it was, it was beautiful until we get to chapter 3, as you know. In, in Genesis chapter 3, it was not just as we have seen in the week. Church, are you with me? It was not just Adam and Eve losing their holiness and their, their uprightness. There is something else profound that happened in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve lost their prince and princesshood. They lost it. When Jesus comes, three times in the book of John, Jesus does not refer, he makes reference to the prince of this world. But not referring to Adam and Eve. He's now referring this title God had prepared for Adam and Eve. This title now is given to who? Now, this world is now the kingdom of the devil. For we are not fighting against what? But we are fighting against principalities, rulers of this dark world. I think somewhere uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and the verses 4, when you get time, when you get home, read it. It refers to the devil as the God of this world. Oh, God forbid. The devil is now being called what? Earth was supposed to be the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven before Genesis chapter 3 was not in heaven. 
He was on earth. Let me tell you why. What makes heaven heaven? It is the presence of God in heaven. Would you want to go to heaven and God is not there? What makes heaven heaven is because of the presence of God there. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I'm not playing too far away from God. Come to where God is, you will find me at his feet. Because that's what makes heaven, heaven. Besides the fact that there is a table of food kilometers long. So, if heaven is heaven because of the presence of God, yet God was present on earth, where was the kingdom of heaven then? Right down here. Right down here. But now the kingdom of heaven has escaped because we have sold the kingdom. We have sold the domain. The dominion was ours. There is no dominion without domain. The domain is gone. The dominion now belongs to the devil. But let me tell you something about the children of God. They're not afraid of the devil. Because right at the cross, the devil's teeth were knocked off. Let me tell you a story. I just have enough time to tell you that story. My mother had a friend. And growing up in my home, when my mother felt she wanted a second voice to discipline us by counseling us, this lady would come. To this very day when I see this lady, I see my mom. She is not a blood relative, but she is close to me that I call her very often. When I need someone to pray for me, I wish I could tell you that I'm a strong person. Sometimes the devil comes left, right, and center that I need prayers. I have very good friends that are pastors and elders all over the world, but when I really need someone to go to a place of secret prayer with me, I go with that lady. I ring her. She lives in Africa. She lives in Zimbabwe. I call her. I say, Mom, the devil is on my case. Would you pray with me? She always prays with me. So mom would send me to her home. So I would go. I hated going to her house. We used to call her Ellen White. Right? To this very day, when sometimes when you hear me and my siblings talking and we say Ellen White, sometimes we don't refer, we're not referring to, we're referring to her. She is an amazing and lovely woman. So my, my issue was not with her. From our house to her house, there is no other way. I just had to go through this home where there was a vicious bulldog. It was called the Rhodesian Pitbull. It's only now that I'm beginning to understand that, you know, as children, there are rumors. People say things that are not true. But as children, someone had whispered into my ear that Rhodesian peoples, they, they, they were actually, Rhodesian peoples were, were, were a breed that was bred from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was called as Rhodesia before it became Zimbabwe. So they were bred from Zimbabwe, from Zimbabwe and the reason was as the first white settlers came, they wanted to, 
to keep lions at bay. So they came up with a special breed. They took different kinds of dogs and made this vicious bulldog that would keep lions at bay. So it was called the Rhodesian pit bull. Now, I, somebody whispered into my ear and said that a Rhodesian pit bull has been known to eat babies and small little boys. So you can imagine the terror and the horror as I every day went past that home. But hey, it was just in my childish mind because this dog was ever in a fence. You know those fences, chick mesh fence? You know those ones? They had fenced their, their hole. So I would get to this corner and for some reason it's as if the dog would sniff, knew, knew my scent. As I get to this corner, it's already waiting for me. So what I would do as I get to this corner, I find it's already waiting. Now looking back, it might have been playing games with me. Because as soon as I see it, I would start right running. I'm running on the pathway and it's running in the fence. I wish I could open my heart to you to see what was happening inside. So terror stricken and in fear as I am running and the dog is right behind me but inside the cage. Are you with me? And I would run somewhere here. I think the, the length of their front yard could have been anything to 100 meters. So that's a long run if you are in, in terror and fear. 100 meters is like 100 kilometers in that space. There is a gate that was always closed. The owner of this, of this home kept chickens, a lot of them. And there were thieves in the village that would steal his... So he was keeping it to just scare the thieves away. But his gate was always closed. Always. There was not even a single day that, I've, that I found it open. But I would run. But only a particular day, I got to that corner. You with me? And the usual thing happened. The dog comes after me in the fence and I'm running and it's running. My friends, I got to the gate. Somebody had forgotten to close the gate. I can tell you that for a split second I died. But for some reason, I thought this is not the place to die. <laughs> I am not going to die and have this dog eat me. I'm going to run. I will die somewhere else, not here. So I ran. I am not kidding you. I think I was traveling faster than, than the, sound, the speed of sound. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm saying so. Because from the home, there was someone shouting at me. I could hear. But all I could hear is that something, someone is shouting at me, saying something. But his words were not getting to me. Because I'm running. <laughs> and as I'm running, on the other side, there were mango trees. Now, the problem with these mango trees is their roots. As they got to the pathway, they protruded onto the surface of the ground. So, as I am running, I hit my toe. 
If you know anything about falling in full flight, you don't fall. You fly first. Before you land, not on all fours, but on all fives, because your head is also going down. Now the dog is in hot pursuit. It's not expecting to catch up with me so soon. So I'm on the ground. It actually collides onto me. And it now thinks it's being attacked. It turns round and whimpers and runs away. I've got debt in my mouth. I'm trying to spit it out and blood is coming out from the mouth. My palms, my knees, I'm wounded. I'm, blood has just come. I'm bleeding from all over the place. And the old man from the house comes to me and says, I have been trying to shout to you that this dog has no teeth. He had inherited the dog from a certain white man that he used to work for. And the, somebody had hit it with a, with a car. And it was no more useful for him and he donated to him as he retired from work. Do you know, was I hurt? Was I? Was I hurt because of the dog? Somebody took care of the dog a long time ago. What got me into trouble? Number one, fear. Number two, running away. Do you know people get hurt running away from the devil? When the devil comes and threatening and we are afraid, we are caught so much with fear, and then we start running. We go all over the place. We run faster than sound. We get hurt running, but as for the devil, he is a conquered foe. Jesus took care of his teeth at the cross. Hey, we, we are not fighting a war of victory with the devil. Victory has already been handed to us. We are walking from victory to victory. Victory is not in the future. Victory is already in the past. But when we run, the devil snarls at us and growls at us and roars at us. And we run. The child is sick. Oh, the marriage is shaking and we, 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 we are caught into this terror and horror and we run to all places and forget that the devil is a conquered foe. He is a conquered foe. But the question is tonight, though he's a conquered foe, why is it that Sometimes it appears like God is not there and the devil is having a field day. You know, Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. I thought Paul was going to comfort me and tell me good news. Are you there in Romans chapter 8? Let me start from, from verse 18. Maybe from verse 19. Verse 18 we'll read at the end. Listen to this. I thought Paul was going to comfort me. But Paul is just confirming my situation. You are with me tonight? For the earnest expectation, oh, it misses something here. 
Right, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity or to suffering. Are you with me? The creature was made subject to what? By the way, tonight I'm preaching on the struggling centuries. That's the title of the message. Struggling centuries, the biblical teaching of suffering. The biblical teaching of suffering. Remember, we're doing the core of Adventism. So the subject tonight, if you like, is the opposite of prosperity gospel. The subject tonight is the theology of suffering. Can I have, the, can I have back this, this, the, 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 the text on the... Yeah. For the creature was made subject to what? Let's change that word and put suffering. Not willingly, but by reason of whom he had subjected this same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 22. For we know, listen to this, for we know what? That the whole creation does what? Groans and travails in pain together until now. Not only they, but we ourselves also, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even who we ourselves, the children of God, that have, the, that have been filled by the Holy Spirit, what do we do? I thought, I've heard somewhere, that if you are a child of God, you don't suffer. I've heard somewhere that if you pray and really pray earnestly and fast and give your tithe and offerings, God will show up and will do amazing things. I know people who tithe faithfully who have no money to pay for the bills at home. No, no, no. Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 says blessings. You see, blessings is not money. Blessings is not material possessions. So pastor, I'm sorry to say this. We have preached something that is not true, that if you give your tithe, you are, your, your, your sums will add up. You just haven't met people, met people who do it faithfully. And God is silent with the abuse. We are not faithful so that God gives us things. Then, let me, let me just put it to you. What then it means is that God needs to be appeased like our ancestral spirits. I told you in Africa, my father was a spirit medium. They had to do stuff for the spirit to come. They would dance all night. From 8 p.m. until 4 a.m., and then the spirit shows up. Are you saying God wants to be appeased by our tithes? Oh, I'm in trouble here because I've heard somewhere that if you give your tithe, God is going to shower money upon you. Yes, Malachi says, I will open the windows of heaven and I will shower you with blessings. Not with money. He got that theology wrong. I am saying to you, my friends, those women, women who cheat on their husbands, they are still married past.
You have done everything by the book. You are like Sarah, you almost even call him master. And you, it boggles your mind. How on earth, especially when you then look at the woman that he's cheating on you with. She has nothing on you. And you ask yourself, I pray, and I think I'm a little better looking when I look into the mirror. What is this guy doing with this thing? God, where are you? He's saying, even us who have received the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan and travail in pain. You see, in verse 18, he starts by saying, the suffering of this present time. What is this present time for? Talk to me, church. It is a time of suffering. Right now, this age that we are living in, it is an age of toiling. It is not yet heaven. I didn't say there's no kingdom of heaven. Jesus ushered in when he came. If, if you read Matthew, Matthew develops the thinking, and I think I don't have the time to develop that thought. Um, he develops the thought of the kingdom of heaven. Not as something that is to come. The kingdom of heaven that has already come. How? As soon as Jesus is anointed, he went out into places preaching, he says in chapter 3. He went out into places doing what? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But watch what he was doing in chapter 3. Raising the dead. What else was he doing? Healing the sick. Here's what Jesus was saying. Devil, as of now, you might have the dominion. But what I have done is brought daylight under your watch. I have broken into your kingdom and I have brought the kingdom of heaven. Your kingdom has death. Your kingdom has sicknesses. I am going to raise the dead and show you that you have no power. Devil, let me show you that you have no power. Lazarus is dead. In fact, I gave you the opportunity to do it. I delayed four days. If I had been four days earlier, he was not going to die. I was going to tell him to come up from his sleeping place. I waited, devil, for you to do the worst. I, I hear when preachers preach at a funeral and they say when a person is dead, God has done his will. God kills no one. That's an accusation on God. The power of death is sin. Oh, you know, no, 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 no. You remember what God said, Elder, you remember what God said? Um, um, that's Joseph. Joseph has been led into, into, into Egypt and is now talking to his brothers after they've, they've come back together. He says, don't worry, my brothers. I know you meant evil. But God took advantage of your evil hearts and made a good thing out of it. Hey, death is not from God. But God sometimes can maneuver his way around, take advantage of the evil intentions of the devil around death. Ah, oh, the church is not with me. So Job says, uh, let's, let's lend this plan. Paul has told us that this is suffering times. Job also adds on. Did I just say to you that I have no good news to tell you? I will tell you why in a few minutes, why I don't have good news for you. But reason number two, because I'll come back to reason number one. Reason number two is because 
How can I preach the sermon of of why we are suffering and God is silent when I'm still suffering? That would mean I've sorted that one out. I haven't. Because I still have the same question just like you. I've looked for God. Sometimes in my prayers I've just told you <laughs> the simple story of Bob because that was the easiest to tell because it doesn't really involve me. I have my own wounds where I wanted God present and he wasn't there. Well, it seemed. So Job says in chapter 14, the days of a what? Of a man. But it's generic for everyone. Are how many? Few. But in their fewness, they are full of what? Sorrow. If you are any man born of a woman has few days, then in those few days, suffering is compacted on them. Why? Still say I have no answer. David, in his own sorrows, gives us, I don't know whether this would comfort us. It doesn't quite comfort me. It actually exacerbates my questions. Chapter Psalms 56. Are you praying for me? We are landing now. Psalms 56. I'll tell you the text I want when I get there. I think the verse is 8. I don't know what, what uh, translations you have there, brother. Um, only. That's fine, you can put it. We'll retranslate it. That's fine, you can put it. Verse 8 says, You number my sorrows. That word wandering is properly translated into today's English as suffering. What do you do? He's referring to God. I thought David was going to say, you take me out of my sorrows. But he says, no God, you know what you do? You number my sorrows. What else do you do? When I cry because of my sorrows, then you come this is what I used to read, how I used to read this text. I used to read it as God has a bottle that is written in all our names. I've got my bottle, you've got your bottle. And then he comes and he puts when I'm crying so that every tear falls into that bottle. That's what I used to think. But no, put it back, put the, script, put the text back. What, what God, what David is saying here is this. He says, read it. In, in the Hebrew writing, the first sentence is always almost explained by the following sentence. He says, you put your tears in my bottle. Are they not in your book? Properly understood, are they not recorded in the book? So what used to happen in the days of David is that when records are taken on a scroll, they will be put in a scroll and then they roll up the scroll then they take a clay jar that was called a bottle. Then they store them in a what? In a bottle. And then they put the record there. So what David is saying to us here is that God has recorded all my tears during my days of suffering. Almost as if that's all he does. David, that's not comforting. What does God do? There is no tear that has ever been shed by any child of Eve and Adam on earth, whether they believe or not. That has not been recorded in the book of remembrance. 
Why? Because whatever God is going to do will not comfort us. Rachel refuses to be comforted because her children are dying like mosquitoes every day. How do you comfort me? Can I lend it? I lend it with a story. I'm finished. In my village growing up, there was a boy that was a little older than me. Let's give him a different name because if I told you his real name, you wouldn't remember it anyway. So let's just give him a new name, call him John. John was a bully of the village. And our village in those mountains that I showed you, they, we are blessed with fruits, wild fruits. We kids, up to this very day, I know the trees that are sweeter than others. So John had a problem. He had taken all the sweet trees and said they were his. So one particular day, I was found eating from one of the trees. It's a wild fruit. And I'm right up the tree. So he comes and he stands beneath the tree and he says, what are you doing in my tree? And I looked down on him and I said, are you crazy? Did you plant this tree? Do you water it? And then he says, I'm waiting for you to come down. And I knew that as soon as I come down, I'm in trouble. And for sure I was in trouble. I cried all the way home. All the way home and I met my brother who was way older than me and John. And my brother just looked at me. And I even cried more. Because he didn't do anything to comfort me. Then one day, are you with me, church? One day, I was on top of a hill heading my father's kettle. I could see from the vantage point my brother riding his bike, going down. And somewhere over down there was John heading his kettle. And my prayer was, brother, he could not hear me. I was way up on top of the mountain. But I wish he could hear me. The boy you are going to meet that's the boy. Deal with him as if he was listening to me. As soon as he saw him, I saw him putting his bike down and walking towards him. And I saw John begin to retreat. And soon enough, John started running. And my brother pursuing, you should have been there on top of the mountain. <laughs> I, I was praising and doing everything. Go, brother, get him. Get him, brother, get him. And soon enough, got hold of him. Are you with me? He got hold of him. And he dealt with him in my full view. Do you know how comforting that was? How do I pl please stop your moralism with me now. In my young mind, I was comforted. I could never be comforted so long as my enemy was still out there bullying others. Ah, you're not with me. So long as our enemy is still out there, it's not yet time for comforting because the enemy is still on. There are still people that are still suffering. 
just wait one day. When God deals with him, did you know that even a thousand years, when we are in heaven, God will still not have comforted us. No. Our comfort is not at the second coming. At the second coming, the problems and the suffering stop. And then we go for a thousand years asking questions. Why? Then God will respond. He will open why your husband died when he was 31. I suppose God would show Hezekiah why God wanted him to die before he had Manasseh. Because the children of Israel would never, if Manasseh had, if Hezekiah had died during the time when he was supposed to die, Children of Israel would never have gone to captivity in Babylon. Manasseh would never have killed Isaiah. Then God will be showing us all this, but it's not yet time for our comfort. Rachel refuses to be comforted because there are still children suffering. Then after a thousand years, the Bible tells me in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, then the devil he who deceived the people and all his angels and the false prophet and the beast, they will be thrown what? In our full view. Are you with me? Then death and grave will be thrown in a lake of fire. In our full view. Then Revelation chapter 21 happens. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Then I saw a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth, and Jerusalem prepared and adorned as a bride. Then God shall be their God. And then I saw there was no suffering there. There was no pain there. That God himself, right there and then, will wipe away our tears. As for now, we are living during the time of suffering. The devil is still prowling around, my friends. I have no good news for you. I'm not here to comfort you. That's not my job. Because truth be told, I'm still suffering with you. But there's a day that is coming, and I have news for you. That day is very soon when our God shall appear, and he himself will wipe away our tears. And God bless you. There was a song that we used to sing in the land of fadeless day. Is there someone who can sing that song and we sing it together with meaning tonight? I don't know. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're going through tonight. Has the doctor told you about a suffering? Some dreaded disease. Is your marriage shaking? Please put the song on the screen. What hymn number is it? 427. Is your marriage shaking? Are the dollars? Maybe it's not there in the, old, in the new hymnal. I don't know. Maybe it's in the old one. Don't worry. Just Google it. Just Google it. Google knows everything. <laughs> Begin to play if you know it by head. Na 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 in the land of endless day lies a city for square. I have no words. No shall wipe away my tears.
the gates of Pearl are made. All the gates of Pearl. In the city four square. All the streets with gold are. Are laid. And there's no night there. God shall wipe away. On the chorus. For there is no light there, and I guess I never close to the city for square. There's last arrival flow. for now my friends the admonition is these are the patient, these are the saints who are they? yes they have the patience and the faith of Jesus to him who will overcome these sufferings there is a promise that is made I don't know who is here tonight but I just want to pray with someone. I don't know what you're going through. I'm just here to tell you that I've, we shall have to suffer a little more before Jesus comes. In fact, the question is, how long shall we suffer? And the Lord answers, wait a little longer until your brethren that have to die like you will have to die. So my friends, our prayer tonight is that we may be faithful Christians through suffering that we may have the endurance of the saints, the patience of the saints. Is there someone like me who is in need of prayer? Is there someone like me who is in need of prayer? Someone is crying, Lord, kumbaya. Someone is in need of prayer, Lord, come by here. I don't know what it is you need prayer for, but there is some pressing issues. And your prayer, you are standing in the need of prayer. You're standing in the need of prayer. Or come to the prayer tower. If you think you really, your walk is a walk of faith. Maybe you're not walking for yourself. You're walking for someone else. Maybe you're walking for someone else. And I need to, I need to assure you here, my friends. We are not standing here as miracle workers. We are saying, even for Jesus, the hour of temptation came. His tears were not wiped away. He had to drink the cup. Sometimes that's all we have to do, drink the cup and his bitterness. Father, I'm standing with my friends this evening. It's Sabbath. We are standing at the gates of time. As we enter into a Jerusalem, a city of time, a city of peace. Father, do not allow us to get into the gates of time with the burdens of the weak. Father, 
we come with our burdens. Tonight, we are responding to an invitation, come unto me that I have laden. We have come, Father. Father, we believe and we know without a shadow of doubt in our minds that you are a God who is a burden reliever. If it pleases you, if it pleases you, Father, there is a woman who is here. Because of dignity, she cannot cry her tears so that we can see them. But Father, the tears of her heart, you know them, you read them very well. There is a man who is here, Father. Oh, sometimes the tears of a man fall within his chest and never shows them out. Stress and depression is settling in, Father. He's here tonight. What we thank you for is that you have been here. You have been here waiting to connect with us. Life makes more, much more sense with you. So we come, Father. But there are times, there are times, Father, when you just present but silent. Those are the moments that we struggle with the more. Even after preaching sermons, Father, we, we still struggle. Even when we know that it's not yet time for righteous children to be comforted, we still struggle, Father, because this knowledge is not such that sometimes makes things better. But you alone, when you have decided not to take the burdens away, you know the reason why you do that. We're asking you then, if that's what you want, you are still God. You still sit on the throne. We will not dictate to you what to do. What we know is that you are faithful. Faithful even through our sufferings. So Father, if this is your will, that this thorn be not removed from our flesh. We, we ask you, Father, then give us the strength. Then give us the stamina to go through. Like you did when you strengthened Jesus. Strengthen us, Father, so that one day when you come, you will say, well done, faithful servant. But the truth is, it is you who would have done it in us. So we receive your faith. We receive your patience. We receive your endurance. We receive your joy through suffering. We consider it all joy when we suffer tribulations because we are your children. We look up to you now tonight, Father, as we go Father, take some of the heaven time and put it into this Sabbath that we can enjoy the Sabbath true. In your name we pray and let the church say amen. And God bless you, my friends. And God bless you. Just, just a few minutes, please don't go. Just a few minutes. few, few minutes and then we go. Yeah. Yeah. We want to thank God for using his men servant. Does the church say amen with me? Yes. Thank you very much. We thank you, Pastor, for, for taking the time to leave your family and come with, with us. Now, let me just ask a question. Was it not the Greek woman who came to Jesus and the son was very ill? And was it the same woman that Jesus said, is it right to give children's food to the dogs? You remember the story? Right? And that pleased the disciples. But if Jesus meant it, you would not have blessed the woman and healed the daughter, the son. You remember? The daughter, eh? Yes, he would not have blessed the woman and healed the daughter. Now, why am I saying this to you? They are, we are on our own here. And yet this message needs to be shared with our friends. There is a big task to be done tomorrow. 
we arranged it in such a way that if we all come and join our pathfinders exactly 11 o'clock there will be marching marching on the streets we have got two groups one group is starting from moland road here it will only take about 18 minutes for a healthy and a strong man like myself but with the pathfinders and the adventurers it might take slightly more now what is it that we need on every intersection we need a man or a woman who will be in high vis so that we protect our children from danger there are about f uh, six nine points that we need on this route that goes behind there we also have